Welcome to Toffee TV. Well, with Crystal Palace shareholder John Texter linking himself with a takeover of Everton this week, we thought it was important to speak to a Crystal Palace fan about his time as a director of Crystal Palace. And obviously, if you're going to speak to a Crystal Palace fan, there's none better than HLTCO himself, Dan Cook to tell us all about what has been going on and what Evertonians can expect if he was to become the owner of Everton Football Club. Dan, welcome to Toffee TV. Let me just How say... Are you doing, before, mate? You yeah, not too bad. Let me just say before we start, uh, fantastic end of the season for Palace. Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, you look like... Well, you know what? We always have this joke on Toffee TV about Crystal Palace of like 12th is like... You you just... you yeah, just a natural just, position, yeah. Yeah, it's like... It's not even like a... Na- it's just a position you fall into every single season, no matter what happens. So the fact that you got top half of the table this season, absolutely brilliant. Well done. Yeah, we had... Well, I mean, we smashed it. You know, finished the season seven unbeaten and it wasn't just that. You know, the, the style of football that we were playing and the energy we had was just incredible, really. And chalk and cheese to what immediately preceded it with Roy... You know, the first game of Oliver Glasner's time, although it wasn't actually in the dugout, was uh, Goodison Park. And yeah, yeah. I mean, that that day, just to quickly touch upon it, there were loads of Everton fans saying, you know, this bang average performance from you. And we were like, this is completely different because <laughs> the players actually looked like they wanted to win it for once. So it was a, yeah, a strange time, the end of Roy Hodgson's tenure, but it's been fantastic ever since. So Brilliant, brilliant. Um yeah, good fan base deserve a bit of deserve a bit of success. I think uh, away from the uh, the natural order of things that have been that's been imposed on the rest of us. Um, <laughs> let's let's just talk about John Texter. You know that's why you're here because we wanted an expert to talk about something concerning Crystal Palace. Uh, John Texter obviously has been linked with with buying at Everton, selling his shares in Crystal Palace. Um, mm. First of all, I mean. Who is this guy? Who, how did he? How did he get onto the board of Crystal Palace? How did he acquire his shares? Well, just to give you a bit of a potted history to the current ownership model of Palace. In 2010, we were deducted 10 points. Simon Jordan's time as owner came to uh, close. Uh, we ended up sort of floating in administration. Took on Sheffield Wednesday in the final day of the season. Got the point we needed to stay in the Championship. And then a month or so later, uh, there was a, a meeting. At, a central London bank, Lloyd's, not Lloyd's TSB, a different one. Um, and Steve Parrish, alongside three other Palace fans, stepped in to take over the club. Um, that in itself was very much needed at the time, but the amount of finance they had between them was nowhere near enough to continue to bankroll a Premier League football club. Thankfully, through some prudent decisions and a bit of luck along the way, we managed to get into the Premier League in 2013. I believe Josh Harris and David Blitzer, who were two American billionaires, came on board in 2015. I can't remember the exact time frame uh, to sort of give us a bit of an extra cash injection. Josh Harris, just as a a bit of a side story to John Texter, owns the Washington Commanders in the NFL now. He is an incredibly rich guy. Um, And John Texter has come along in the last three or four years. He had... I think the, the company was called, or it may well still exist, Facebank, I believe it's called. Um, I'm not sure if it was AI or graphics or something, but he basically bought shares in Crystal Palace, I think with the intention of eventually becoming the majority shareholder at the club. You know, if you look at his football history, or at least his current holding of clubs, he is very much someone who has a multi-club model under his Eagle Football Holdings umbrella. So you've got us, You've got Lyon in France, you've got Molenbeek in Belgium and Botafogo in Brazil. And I think, I mean, I can't speak obviously for him personally, but I think he has become frustrated at the fact that he is unable to secure the extra 6% of shares to give him the 51 and therefore more of a say in the, the shot calling from day to day. It's a strange dynamic at Palace because I don't believe that Steve Parrish has 51% himself. He has a significant shareholding within the club still, but he is the one that is tasked with the day-to-day running. But until John Texter gets the 51%, he can't then 
not push him aside, but he can't have more of a say in the day-to-day -day goings on in the club. And I believe that is why he has grown frustrated and why we find ourselves at this point with him talking about cashing in his chips, selling his share in Palace and then trying to buy Everton from Farhad Mashiri. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny really because it sounds very similar to when Farhad Mashiri came to Everton and him having similar problems at Arsenal. I think that's... That's a mm. big. That's sort of a a worry for Evertonians if if any of this is uh, actually real. So obviously you mentioned there he is someone who who has mentioned a couple of times about the limitations of obviously PSR or FFP whatever you want to call it. Mm. He does want to spread his wings. Has he has he hinted at what he'd like to do with Crystal Palace if he could get hold of the the entire club and or certainly fifty percent of it and and start spending that money. Well, it's, it's a difficult thing to... I mean, I said, I don't know if it was you on the DMs before we did this or somebody else within the Toffee TV network. But from my point of view, striking the right sort of tone with this is difficult because obviously I'm not privy to boardroom conversations. Yeah. But if you look at... So Eagle Football Holdings, as far as I understand it, it isn't just him. There are a number of people involved within this... Uh, Oh, the hedge, the hedge fund is probably the wrong term. Mm -hmm. It's a collection of wealthy individuals that all make up this collection of, of potential owners of different football clubs. You've got Lyon in France, obviously a huge institution in and of themselves. If you rewind back to the start of this season, they were in relegation trouble themselves. And, mm -hmm. you know, they had their ultras demanding that their players sorted it out on the pitch. You've had him... Over in Brazil, there was one high-profile incident where he went down to pitch side and said there was corruption in the Brazilian league because of the title race between Botafogo and I can't remember who else now. I think he was being sued by the Brazilian FA and was prepared to sort of fight that in Brazilian courts. He said he seems to me to be the sort of person that spreads himself incredibly thin. You know, I don't think there is any denying that he loves football and he wants to be actively involved in it. But obviously... The English football model is not one that necessarily sits particularly well with the multi-club vehicle anyway, because, I mean, even from our point of view, I'm not suggesting Crystal Palace are as big as Leon, but if you look at the money that sloshes around in the Premier League, who quite sits second fiddle to the other in terms of that hierarchy? Because, I mean, Molenbeek in Belgium are obviously the smallest of the four. You then throw Botafogo in, who, I mean, we all know South American clubs tend to sell their players to European clubs for decent sums of money. They become sort of talent factories, or at least that's the aim. You throw Leon and Palace into the mix, and it's a bit of a, a difficult one to work out in terms of the true order of things. And I would imagine that would only become more complicated if you threw Everton in instead of Palace because of the new stadium and the ambitions yeah. of the fan base. So I wouldn't be surprised if there have been discussions behind the scenes where Palace haven't been particularly comfortable with the idea of sliding into this multi-club model. And that's why there's been opposition to him securing these extra 6% of shares. But I mean, I, I have no way of knowing how much money John Texter has, how much money he can get his hands on and whether or not it would be a solid prospect for Everton. You know, it, it could well be one of those out of the frying pan into the fire things because we all know the issues that Everton have had with the ownership and finances over the last few years. But, I mean, at the same time, if 777 is going to collapse, you sort of have to look for any port in a storm, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And and obviously the whole 777 thing was based exactly the same on, on similar principles of, of a multi-club ownership. And obviously the Premier League team being probably at the, uh, certainly for us, we seemed like we were going to be at the top of it. But as you said there, mm. it's un you're unsure with Palace. I mean, what what's his relationship like with the fans? Because obviously we've seen um, we've seen banners in the crowd. I mean, could you explain that a little bit to to our well, fan base or to other fan bases why why that came out? Again, it's it's such a, a complicated picture, and you know, luckily we've got time to sort of discuss it here. Josh Harris and David Blitzer, as I've already mentioned, are incredibly wealthy individuals, but I think they have grown frustrated by the figurative glass ceiling that exists in the Premier League because of PSR, because of our turnover compared to some of the more illustrious clubs and the size of our stadium, the size of our corporate income. And because of that, they have sort of taken, not a back seat, but I mean, they were involved in a potential bid to buy Chelsea when Roman Abramovich was forced to let go of the club before Todd Bowley and Clear Lake Capital came in. John Texter came into the football club uh, and part financed the Category 1 Academy we now have. I think he came in, not necessarily with, with bold ambitions, but I think he wanted to really get his feet under the table and potentially, you know, grow his stake with the club as time passed. And I think he has 
encountered, I wouldn't necessarily say roadblocks, but we all know, you know, you've got Steve Parrish, just as a, a bit of an insight, he's a lifelong Crystal Palace fan. He rescued the club from potential oblivion in 2010 and has taken us from the foot of the championship to 11 straight years in the Premier League. So the, the idea of him relinquishing control to a guy who, with the best will in the world here, this is no disservice to Everton, but if you're protect, prepared to cash in your chips at Palace and go and buy another Premier League club, it's fair to assume you don't have that close an affinity with Crystal Palace in the first place. So I think the fans have always been a little bit wary of John Texter in that sense. The banners away at Arsenal weren't about him specifically. They were about a lack of direction because of Roy Hodgson coming back for another year. The fact that we felt like we were treading water, it didn't really seem as though there was a long-term plan. Obviously, that has shifted now with Oliver Glasner's arrival. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you look at the three Americans, Harris, Blitzer and Josh Harris, uh, sorry, and um, John Texter, and it just felt a bit of a, a mishmash, really. But in many ways, if John Texter is able to sell his 45% stake of Crystal Palace to an individual that is more focused on just being part of the collective. I think not every Crystal Palace fan, because obviously it's a broad church, but a fair few of them would be happy to sort of wave him on his way and allow him to be a, a primary shareholder elsewhere. Is this an idle threat? Is it? Is it him? Is it him? I don't think um, so, no. No, you not think he's trying to push to try and get the extra shares? Or, or you know, no. I, I, no, just he just says. Because I, I, I don't. I think. I think he knows full well that he can't get them, which is why he has grown. He's very. And, and again, I don't want to sound like I'm coming on here throwing him under the bus because that isn't really the case. And obviously, mm. as a fan, I mean, I do this for a living, and I like yeah. to think I'm relatively well informed. But at the same time, you can't be privy to every conversation that takes place behind closed doors but he is quite vocal in the press he will speak openly about wanting to be more involved about this decision about that decision and sometimes you feel as though things like that are better kept in-house but yeah. I think he has probably exhausted every single avenue he could think of to try and secure these six percent extra shares to take primary control and now that he knows that is not within his remit he is moving on to pastures new but again that, I, mean, I can't speak for Everton fans myself, but I mean, you can probably see the, the logic behind my thought process of, well, if he's prepared to dump us yeah. for a, a direct competitor, then how does that stand in 10 years if Everton aren't doing what he wants on the pitch and he grows not bored of it, but frustrated by the lack of on-field progress? You know, that's that's basically the way I would view it myself. Yeah, absolutely. I always feel the same about when you buy a player and the play, player kicks up a fuss to leave a club and you think, well, mm. he might do that to us in a couple of years' time if we're not meeting him. Has he had any interest in those shares? Is 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 he struggling to get rid of them? Well, I think, obviously, Crystal Palace, I mean, you alluded to it at the beginning of this podcast, we are on an upward trend at the moment. We've got four players in the England squad for the Euros. We've got a number of highly sellable assets. You know, you look at Elise, Eze, Gay, Walton, Decore, even Mateta, you know, 13 in 13. There are plenty of clubs that are sniffing around our players. And that in itself, with the Category 1 Academy and the new main stand that's being built, we're probably as attractive a prospect right now to a potential buyer as you could have had. But at the same time, buying 45% of a football club and knowing you are not going to have the ultimate say is not the easiest sell. And obviously, from a competition perspective, he can't buy shares in Everton until he is completely out of the Crystal Palace hierarchy. So I think it's one of those situations from my point of view where, you know, I understand why he wants to do it. I understand the motivation behind it because he can get his feet fully under the table and, and call the shots. Mm. But I don't think it's necessarily going to be as easy as just clicking his fingers and selling 45% of a Premier League football club in the time frame necessary to take over this summer. Yeah, it's it's obviously it's obviously uh, it's a Crystal Palace in a fantastic place, and and you mentioned the stand there. Is is that going to be going ahead? Because that's been sort of like a barrier, hasn't it, in the last couple of years? Mm. The new stand, obviously, it felt like a bit of a chicken and egg thing. That you know, maybe not the money to build it, but then you know, if you want the investment, you need the stadium, obviously improved. Yeah, I mean, so if you go back to Simon Jordan's time in charge, he tried on two or three occasions to get planning permission and everything through red tape wise, and it just wasn't doable. It's taken the current ownership the best part of a decade to get there. We have the the legal say-so to do it. I think because of COVID and everything else, the cost of building materials went through the roof. So they had to do 
a capital raise from the current ownership to secure the money and ring fence that I believe that is all still going ahead uh, and is ready to not necessarily break ground but we are I mean it's one of those things it's become a bit of a running joke with Crystal Palace fans you know when's the new main stand going up well it'll be next summer it'll be next summer but I'm assuming it will actually come at some point I'm not sure there's a concrete date yet for the breaking of ground but obviously it's still within the club's plans and it would help us you know, hugely in terms of our turnover and everything else with PSR yeah well you could just start building it without having actually any money you know that's what we did we just we just yeah. you know just, just, hope throw for the best. A, just throw a, a stadium up and just hope someone else pays for it like what we've done um, like John Sexton <laughs> yeah maybe it is John Sexton behind the scenes all this time um just back to just back to uh, just one thing as well though there was banners also at the Palace Garden I, I, I read something like this are they because when you bought uh, when he bought Leon, there was a uh, political divide, let's say, between the two fan bases? Is that is that true? No, I don't think that would be the case. I mean, yeah. to be fair, I can't. Once again, I yeah. can't speak for every Palace fan. You've got the Homestyle fanatics; they tend to be quite outspoken in their views. But I don't, I don't remember anything specific about Leon and Crystal Palace under the same umbrella. Because if you actually look at Eagle Football Holdings, Molenbeek, Botafogo and Leon are under his control entirely, whereas Crystal Palace mm. are only 45% John Texters. Yeah. And with that, I think Steve Parrish, Josh Harris, David Blitzer, they have very much not distanced themselves from it. I think they are still in conversations about yeah. the whole football model, but we are not we are not hook, line and sinker part of that same umbrella, if you see my point. Yeah. So because he's got 45% and he's got 100% of the others, um, you've got a situation where it's sort of not unhappy bedfellows, but they, they sort of rub along, if you see my point, rather than being all lumped into the same pot. But if you look at Leon specifically, you know, I, I, I haven't got the exact figures off the top of my head, but there was a hell of a lot of debt that that football club was in. And I mean, I am not privy to John Texter's bank accounts and exactly where he gets his money from, how much money he's got to call upon. But I do, and I have often felt like this as a Palace fan, it's almost spreading yourself too thin. Mm. You know, you've got very passionate fan bases. Leon, Botafogo, they're huge football clubs in their respective countries. You throw Everton into the mix as well. You've got three huge global institutions that you're trying to keep happy simultaneously. And if you're going to do that in a multi-club model where the ultimate aim has to be to move players up the scale... I'm just not sure that, for example, Everton fans and Leon fans are going to get on as well as they could because you obviously look after yourself from a tribal perspective, not thinking about what Leon are doing over in League 1. So, you know, it's a, it's a tricky one for sure. And it certainly doesn't, I think, match particularly well with English football fandom. No, absolutely not. So, I mean, obviously, I mean, what you're saying is you really, Palace have had no real sort of involvement in this multi-club model then it's just more John Texter's little baby rather we, than something part of Crystal Palace if you not had any players out of this or, or players no, we, the other we occasionally, way we occasionally send players on loan to uh, Molenbeek that has happened Luke Plange I believe who we signed from Derby County uh, went there I think Malcolm Bibiowi Teo Adaramola like the fringe players in the academy in the 21s but you know this is the thing you, you could look at it two ways because Matthias Franza came in from Brazil over the summer. I'm not a fool. We all know that probably the scouting networks that are available to Botafogo have been utilised somewhat by our scouting network. And we have decided to have a go with Matthias Franza and see whether or not he can hit the ground running. You know, and that, that ability to get more of a boots on the ground on, on whether a player is good enough to make the step up to the Premier League, that probably has been a direct positive of you know John Texter's involvement in that club. But in terms of you know getting a player from Leon for for nothing, that hasn't happened. We sent Jake O'Brien there on a permanent basis uh, at the start of this season. He actually scored against PSG in the French Cup final at the weekend. But I mean, again. I don't want to talk negatively about multi-club models as a collective because they can work. You've seen it with Manchester City. They've got clubs all over the world. But it always feels to me like something of a pyramid scheme. You know, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're looking at moving players up the scale. And, and once they reach the top club within that particular pyramid, where do they go? You sell them on for astronomical profits if you can. And the whole thing sort of rubs along. But I mean, Leon's fan base, your fan base, our fan base, 
I'm not interested in what Leon are doing. You know, if, if it benefits us, great. But if you have to constantly be there like squabbling siblings, I just don't think it particularly works well from a, a cohesive point of view. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan. And as I said, we've we've literally had a nearly a year to learn all about the, the this with with the triple seven situation mm. and um and and trying to work out how it would work. And clearly, it just doesn't work. Like you've just said, if you are spreading it too thin, if you're a Manchester, if you're a City group and you've got that kind of money, you can do that. You can invest in all these clubs, mm. and you know the top dog really is one of the top dogs in the world. But I think for mm. for the rest of us, it just it just doesn't really work because we will always be arguing who's the bigger club. I mean, of of course, yeah. Palace and Everton have the advantage of being in the most the richest league in the world, so we have that advantage. But there might be other clubs. I mean, I've got no idea what kind of fan base Botafogo has got, but I imagine it's, it's I am yeah I imagine it's absolutely huge. But they obviously they're stuck in the Brazil league, so there's there's very little mm. they can do economically. And it'll be sort of similar with Leon as well. I'm sure they've got a huge fan base, but they're stuck on Lagoon and and you know they're struggling to get a TV deal. So yeah, it's it is it is really it's you know I think football has opened the Pandora's box by getting involved in this multi club, and it's getting worse because we've heard overnight that like you know Manchester United might be struggling to get into the Europa League, but it, but but actually they won't be struggling because the UEFA will bend over backwards for them, and and then you just think, well, what's the point? Yeah, it, 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 I mean, this is the thing. I would never want to come on to a conversation like this and say John Text are bad because of X, yeah. Y, and Z. Obviously, it could work. He has nearly won the title with Botafogo. That in itself would have been a historic thing for them. Leon have qualified for Europe, but they were in a relegation battle for the first mm. quarter of the season. If you look at Crystal Palace, you know, again, you wouldn't necessarily know about the ins and outs of Palace's hierarchy, but mm. you see Palace doing well over the last two or three months. Oliver Glasner there, how much has John Texter had to say about that? How much of an influence was he in Britain? You just don't know. Yeah. So it may well be that Everton get John Texter in and for two or three years, it goes swimmingly, you qualify for Europe and, and you keep that sort of momentum going. Mm. On the other side of things, if he runs out of money or if you know one of the clubs within his multi-club model takes up too much of his time or mental capacity and you end up falling by the wayside because of it. It just feels to me, and maybe I'm old school in this, but an owner of a football club should be primarily concerned with that football club. It doesn't matter if it's accurate and Stanley. It takes over your life in many ways and it should. So to have not just multiple clubs, multiple clubs in different high profile leagues, I just feel as though it's a, a bit of a hide into nothing, but he does seem to be making it work just about. It's just a, a bit of a struggle to work out exactly how at this point. Yeah. And that, that leads me on to my final question, really. It, does he re- have a real passion for football? Is that something that you've seen? Obviously, we, we've all seen the clip of, of the in Brazil. Has he, has he mm. showed that at Palace? Has he showed that passion? Does he, does he go to the games regularly? Is he that kind of guy? Yeah, I mean, he is, he is someone who, again, well, I've never met the guy. I tried to reach out to him um, prior to him becoming a shareholder at Palace. And he, at that point, said he was happy to come on and do an interview. That sort of went cold. I know that his son speaks to me semi-regularly. They go to, to games together. He sat in a Holmesdale end before. They've done away games. He spoke in an interview with Matt Woosnam, the Athletics uh, Palace correspondent, about the fact that he tried to get into one of the pubs by the ground and the doorman didn't know who he was. And someone said, oh, this is John Texter. He oh, he's a part owner of Palace. And he got turned away at the door, but he quite likes that anonymity. I'm not really sure. I mean, don't get me wrong. He clearly loves football because he wouldn't be involved yeah. to this extent if he didn't. But I mean, for me, and again, he may well come back and say this is complete rubbish. It's just my perspective I feel as though it may not be football primarily that he loves, but also the notoriety of owning a football club, if you see my point. Because I think yeah. it's quite an intoxicating thing. You know, an American comes over, he's got this passionate fan base in France, this passionate fan base in England, passionate fan base in Brazil, and he is the ringleader of it all. And I think that can be quite addictive. I don't doubt that he loves football, but at the same time, you know, we've been burnt before with owners, Mark Goldberg, Simon Jordan, who have run out of money and we've ended up nearly ceasing to exist. So I'm not safety first, but I always like to think that I would err on the side of caution in terms of my owners. And with that in mind, I would rather have a majority owner who was only really bothered about Crystal Palace rather than having this multi-club model. So, you know, it's not as though I'm coming on here and saying it will be a disaster because I don't necessarily think it will. 
But at the same time, if he can find a willing buyer for his 45% of the Palace stake, then as long as the current hierarchy remain in place, I don't think there'll be too many uh, sad faces in SE25. Uh, interesting, interesting. Thanks, Dan, as ever. Brilliant. No worries. Uh, to get your views on this, you can find Dan, obviously, on X at HLTCO, doing some fantastic work there, not just on Crystal Palace, but all football. And if you check out his podcasts, you'll hear all his views, which are generally very well balanced and very well uh, sourced. So, Dan, thank you for joining us. And uh, thanks to, uh, well, it's great to hear your views on John Texter. <laughs> Big thank you to Dan for his time today. Don't forget, make sure to follow him over on X slash Twitter um, for a bit of everything, really. Bit of everything, bit of Crystal Palace, bit of general football, bit of everything. He, and he has uh, podcasts over on his Patreon channel as well and over on his YouTube channel. So a uh, big thank you to, uh, to Dan, being very educational. And uh, don't forget... If you want more videos, join us over on Toffee TV Premier. Also, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe if you haven't already. See you later.